And Tim, thank you very much. I love it when um, horse riders of the apocalypse kind of take us down into those deep, dark places and then say, but don't worry. It's going to be OK. We've got the resources to turn this all around. We've just got to get our act together rather quicker than we might imagine. I, I like that stuff. Yes. It's good. It's good. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to continue in that, uh, in that theme. Um, I must say it was fascinating for me hearing uh, David Holmgren. He's uh, a person who I've known for a long time, and Bill Mollison was someone I knew. These are people who featured in my early days, as it were, when I was thinking about how we should respond to the emerging crises on planet Earth. And the crisis in how we see ourselves as a dominant species, the dominant species on this planet. And I guess for me, their work, the whole notion of permaculture and the design principles that underlie permaculture have been part of my evolving philosophy about what will make the world a better place for a very long time, going back to the 1970s. But they've never been front of mind for me. They've never, as it were, shaped the advocacy that I have, although they've formed it quietly in the hinterland that each of us has at the back of our mind or the back of our spirit, as it were, those things that shape us imperceptibly as we set about doing the work that we do. So it's a huge privilege for me to be here today. I think this is a wonderful uh, event to have brought together, a celebration of so much incredible work going on in so many countries. Did you say 50? 135 countries. But here today, yes. 70 here. 70 here, incredible, 135 around the world. So that's the spirit in which I start this. And I start from this notion of um, reorganizing big systems in the world today, this whole concept of design principles. I've just been reading a, a biography of a quite extraordinary man called Dick Dusseldorp, who probably won't be known to many of you, but he was the founder, chief executive, and chair of an organization called Lendlease, which is now one of the largest property companies in the world. Property developer, contractor, started in Australia, now a huge global company. And this guy's biography is extraordinary. He's a Dutchman. He went to Australia in the 1950s, just after the war. He ended up in a country that was trying to find its way into the modern world in Australia. He looked at the building and construction business, and he came to the conclusion that the entire basis on which that industry was formed at that stage was so fundamentally flawed that there would be no way of using the skills of the construction industry to create a better built environment. And the reason why I'm mentioning is this, is that, yes, he then set about very successfully to create a big global multinational company, but he did something rather more remarkable, which is he set about to transform the operating code which underpinned the success of that industry, to change the basic design principles. And it took him a long time, and obviously he worked with lots of other people, but he looked at the really perverse, dysfunctional relationships between all the different players in the construction value chain, as it were, from the architects to the designers to the specifiers, those who procure the materials, the, the builders, the financiers, the planners. He looked at all of these elements in a very complex supply chain and re-engineered the relationships between them to create opportunities for a completely different, far more efficient, a far more attuned approach towards construction um, in that country. And we've inherited a lot of that back here in the UK. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because it seems to me every industry, anywhere in the world, is going to have to engage in a similar process of examination, scrutiny of what it is that has allowed it to prosper up until a certain point in human history, and to commit to a kind of process of re-engineering the basic operating code. And I don't think there's any part of our economy today that isn't going to have to do that fundamental exercise. 
If you go back to that period of time after the Second World War, Tim passed over that as a fleeting nanosecond in the history of life on Earth, quite rightly, but those 65 years or 70 years since the end of the Second World War have, of course, completely shaped the presence of humankind on this planet, largely because of our ability to harness, capture, and use fossil fuels in the way that we've done so, quotes, successfully during that time. Some experts call this the period of the great acceleration, everything exploding in terms of our use of land, natural resources, energy, the creation of wastes of every conceivable kind, the huge surge in the expectations on the part of humankind that have shaped today's consumer-based, consumerist society. The great acceleration captures really well what has happened in those 70 years. Our problem, and it is a massive problem, is that most of the mindsets that now dominate today's geopolitical arena, the mindsets of our politicians, our corporate business leaders, of our commentators in the media, and I have to say the mindsets of many, many people in academia, obviously not Tim's mindset, as we know, but many people in academia, their mindsets are 100% shaped by their experiences in that period, that mini era of the Great Acceleration. And it's practically impossible for them to think about the profound redesign process that we're now going to have to go through given that the era of the Great Acceleration has already ground to a halt. Or if not ground to a halt as yet, it has shown us that it's absolutely about to grind to a halt in the very near future. So we're kind of stuck in an interesting place that we've had this period of astonishing growth in what it is that has made humankind this incredible presence on the Earth today. That has shaped so much of the uh, intellectual, the cognitive process that's going on in our minds the whole time, individually and collectively, and we haven't yet found a way of escaping from that intellectual lock-in, that sense that people's minds are so profoundly shaped by that 70-year, tiny little period of human history that we haven't yet found the way through to what lies on the other side of that. And nowhere, of course, is this more true than in this whole area of food production and how we use the earth to provide us with the wherewithal to feed however many human beings there will be on this planet. Now, you hear this all the time, of course, this issue about food security, as it's called. How do we produce enough food for 7 billion people today? And 8 billion people by the turn of the century, and 9, oh, 9 billion by the turn of the century, and maybe some people keep pushing out beyond 9 billion to 10 billion and so on. Well, this, of course, lies at the heart of the insanity of the human adventure today, that we really do think there is no upper limit to the number of human beings that can be sustained in a dignified, socially just, and compassionate way on this planet. This is not the occasion for me to let rip in terms of the idiocy of today's world when it comes to population planning, but just take it as read that every single thing that we have to do to enable human beings to live sustainably on this planet is made harder, is compounded by the fact that we can't address ourselves intelligently and compassionately to the business of really serious family planning. It's a massive issue that won't go away or greatly heartened by the Pope, having woken up to the story about climate change. Um, some of us now hope that the Pope will go the next step, which will be to wake up to the story about family planning. Um, OK, that was just a, sm a minor diversion, which I felt was <laughs> only since Tim mentioned the inevitability of 9 billion people. You see, when someone says to me, it's inevitable we're going to have 9 billion people, I think, oh, God, no, it can't be inevitable. It's just, a, it's just a nightmare to have to contemplate that stuff. So put that to one side. 
If you listen to politicians today talking about food security, what you will hear as the dominant light motif in their, in their pitch is we have to double the amount of food that we need to feed the world by X. And some people will say by 2025, by 2030, by 2040. They'll all have a kind of doubling story going on in their mind, a period of time during which we have to double the amount of food that we need. A former chief scientist of the UK government, a very uh, interesting and, and brilliant man called Professor John Beddington, was the first man to outline this kind of story about food security captured through his triangle at that time of needing to increase the amount of energy that we need, the amount of water that we need, and the amount of food that we need. And he had this great story that he sold into government ministers that this was the big challenge of our time. We had to double this by then and double that by when and do all of this and this was the way in which we would meet the needs of humankind. Now, at that time I was chair of the Sustainable Development Commission here in the UK and I have to admit that John and I had some interesting exchanges along the way. And I did ask him at the time that he was most active in his advocacy of this approach to food production, whether it made any sense to talk about doubling the amount of food we needed without even mentioning, as a footnote, the issues of food waste and meat consumption. He wasn't too amenable to this set of suggestions, but happily, we are beginning to see things in a slightly different way. And you will have noticed that even in the popular press, in our global media, the focus on food waste has crept up and up and up and up. Even the Daily Mail now has got the idea that it is really not very sensible to go on calling for a doubling in the amount of food production until we actually address the issue of food waste. And this issue is huge. Please do not think this is a, a minor irritant in the total food production system. Depending on which analysis you read, somewhere between 30 and 45% of all the food that is harvested from the land never actually turns up as a nutritional input into the human body. Somewhere between 30 and 45%. And remember that much of that production system is, of course, dependent on hugely intensive inputs, whether we're talking fertilizers, chemicals, energy, water, whatever it might be. And all of that embodied energy and resource intensity is then wasted because it never does the job that it was created to do, which was to provide part of a balanced diet for humankind, or a vaguely balanced diet. So actually, if you wanted to double food production by 2030, by far the most intelligent starting point for that would be to eliminate the problems of food waste. Now, You'll never quite eliminate the problems of food waste because there are all sorts of places where food just leaks out of the system, where we can't net the full nutritional value of food at a certain point in the value chain. But we could be doing so much more. And equally, we are unlikely to address the issue of food security very intelligently if we don't begin to confront the question of meat consumption. Because right now, much of the demand for new agricultural produce is geared to using that produce as feeds for meat production. Right now, at the moment, there is a massive expansion in the amount of soy, soya that is being grown, particularly in South America. And we're so used to thinking about the impacts of agriculture in that continent, in South America, in terms of the damaging impact on the Amazon rainforest, that we seem to be completely blind to the impact of the expansion of the soybean industry on the other ecosystem that is very, very important in South America, namely the Cerrado. There is no international campaign about the destruction of the Cerrado, but it is going on all the time as this industry just moves in deeper and deeper into that space. Now, I'm only using these examples of food waste on the one hand and meat production and consumption on the other to demonstrate how crazy it is 
to try and have an intelligent conversation about food security when you can't actually address some of the most critical elements about wasteful production and consumption in the system today. And you can't somehow get back to a really intelligent discussion about the core underpinning elements in food production, namely soil, nutrients, water, biodiversity, that whole set of embracing elements in a system which are still left to one side in the current debate about food security. It must drive all of you absolutely insane to listen to these debates and know just how misplaced they still are. Just how much a product of these locked-in mindsets they still are. Yet, sometimes, if the truth be told, we are our own worst enemy in that regard. I've been involved for a very long time as an active member of the Soil Association and supporter of organic farming and all sorts of other things, as you'd expect. I've been involved for decades in the debate about GM, genetic modification. For me, it doesn't play a particularly big part in the future of humankind, but there may be some role for some GM story at some point in the future. But just think about how that debate has unfolded in our midst. Just think about we, the way we discuss the story of GM. GM Nation was the great debate that we had here in the UK. And on the one hand, you had the proponents of GM saying that in that set of technologies lie all sorts of answers to really critical problems that we face today, including, of course, increased yields. That's the big promise, increased yields. And we, on the other hand, would be arguing, yes, but there are all sorts of problems about that, and there are impacts on the environment, possible impacts on human health, although I've never actually thought that was a really particularly big deal. And therefore, we need to exercise a much clearer precautionary principle before we start rolling out yet more GM strains all around the world. If you look back on that debate historically, you'll find that hardly ever did we use that debate to invite people to go right back to a different kind of analysis about food production, a different kind of analysis about the relationship between humankind and the earth and the natural systems on which we depend, to re-examine those relationships, those reciprocities between us and the Earth. We had a technical debate about whether GM did or didn't constitute a threat, would or wouldn't produce additional yields, additional foodstuffs. Very rarely did that debate allow us to go right back into the heartland of what the permaculture movement has always been about, which is a different set of design principles to underpin the way in which human beings produce the food that they need for the future. So we became, if you like, victims of this set of locked-in mindsets. We had to play on their territory, on their turf. We couldn't really start exercising our opportunity to talk about this stuff very differently. So for me, it's brilliant that conferences like this now are reminding people of the need to go deeper, to dig down into what these principles really tell us. And I was fascinated just reading some of the materials that are becoming available to all of us. I mean, it is extraordinary, if you think back over the history of the permaculture movement, the wealth, the sheer abundance of resources available to us now, the opportunity to connect instantly with brilliant examples of permaculture projects all around the world is staggering. I hope some of you are connected to a web-based initiative called Food Tank, the Food Tank, which is something I've been a part of right from its inception, based in the USA, but a very global sense of what is happening in the food story around the world. And the Food Tank recently, back in July, did this brilliant little analysis about what's going on in the world of permaculture and came up with this lovely summary that more than a million people have now been certified in one form of permaculture qualification or another, in more than 140 countries around the world, with more than 4,000 individual projects alive and well somewhere on that wonderful map that we saw before. This is a lot of, this is a lot of activity.
And in the run-up to this conference, I was able to do a tiny bit of work with Phil Lauren, working with your wonderful magazine, Maddie, bringing together a series of people and projects to produce six, nine, actually, I think nine little films called Living with the Land. And I do strongly urge you to have a look at that series. I'm sure it'll get a lot of plugging during the course of this conference, but it is really a brilliant little set of nine background films in terms of what's happening with permaculture. I think they're all based here in the UK, but as an example of what happens everywhere else. Now, for me, as I look at all of that, I see in it not just the value of each of those individual projects, but I see this bigger story that Tim was hinting at, this sense that there is something going on under the surface almost, almost as a subversive movement in our society, where we're not just growing food in more intelligent and sensible ways. We're not just allowing organic matter to grow in the soil, but we are growing adaptive capabilities in our own minds. We are challenging these locked-in mindsets. We're allowing people to free themselves from the dominance of those industrial mindsets. This is both an intellectual and a spiritual process that is going on. And some people choose to emphasize more on the intellectual side of it, and I'm sure we all welcome the new research network, which was launched today. Brilliant and really important. But many people, of course, like to dig down into that as much through a set of spiritual insights as through the intellectual and scientific insights. When I wrote the book that you very kindly referred to, sorry, I should, in the interest of green capitalism, I should have been flogging my book here today. So should you, Tim. You've got you to get better at this green capitalism stuff, you know. But when I was doing that book, it was a most amazing period in my life because it gave me an opportunity to do research into reasons to be hopeful reasons to stop my own deep apocalyptic tendencies, to nip them in the bud every time I find myself heading off down one of these deeply gloomy rabbit holes that I've spent so much of my life in, and bring it back to this sense of genuine hopefulness around what it is that people are doing today. Because this story that the permaculture movement has been such an important part of for decades, is not just doable, it is being done. It's not a theoretical possibility that might at some stage come good at some point in the future when all else has demonstrably failed. This is a story that is unfolding in the midst of people's lives right now. And being able to get to grips with some of that stuff, to research the story of agroforestry in Africa, for instance, which is an incredible story emerging in our midst, to understand the power of different agronomic techniques around things like mixed cropping, to look at the explosive story about urban farming all around the world. Not all of it, of course, based on permaculture design principles, but a lot of it thinking more deeply about the relationship between us and the places in which we're producing the food that we need. And this was wonderful. It was just an eye-opening journey through literally hundreds of projects and examples of people making this solution, this alternative, emerge in the midst of our lives. Now, some of that stuff is probably going to be quite challenging to those of us who think that all good food really should come from a beautiful relationship between ourselves and the land. Because actually, that isn't the future of all food production. Food production in 2050 looks very different from the way it looks today. And that's because the only way to reduce the pressure on the limited amount of land we have available to produce good, nutritious food on a genuinely sustainable basis without massive cruelty to animals, the only way to do that, to lift the pressure from that land, is to start using science for some different kinds of food production. I'm not going to go into this in any great detail, because I know how difficult it is, but artificial meat in 2050, meat grown in laboratories, in factories, in systems that, where there's no connection with the natural world, the earth at all, will be a major part of our protein intake in 2050. Now, most people at that stage, I can just sort of, Ew. yeah, we don't really want to go down that road. Don't you? I think you really do want to go down that road. 
When you think about it from an animal welfare perspective, you think about it from a land perspective, you think about it from an input and climate perspective, I tell you, that whole area of research and development that is going on now, and is exploding, whether you like it or not, is fascinating. How much of our protein do you think will come from algae in 2050? Tim briefly passed over the phenomenally important role that algae have played in all of the, well, not all, but in some of these revolutionary moments on planet Earth. I think algae are about to start playing another astonishingly important part in the history of humankind and food production. I was recently in Brazil and visited a new plant just been in production for a year, owned by a large American uh, company called Solazyme, in association with another even larger American company called Bungi, which is producing oils, algae oils, using genetically modified microalgae to produce a product that at the moment is sourced by companies from palm oil. Now, as you know, there's a big, big, big controversy about palm oil. Palm oil is a crop, a product that has destroyed an awful lot of rainforest. And what this company is doing, and it is slightly like alchemy, but I'll just share it with you as a sort of passing uh, moment. They take roughly two milligrams of microalgae, which actually some of which are not GM, but some are, they then feed those little critters, as they call them. I think it's quite it's a nice way of making you feel comfortable about genetically modified algae. They feed the little critters with sugar that is sourced, of course, from a wonderfully Bon Sucro certified sugar production system all around them. In these great big fermentation tanks, the algae grow rapidly because they can't believe that they're being looked after so attentively and with so much love and care. And within the course of just a few days, they grow from their two, two milliliters to roughly 150,000 or 200,000 liters. Then they stop feeding them, which is really cruel, of course. But at that point, the microalgae go into adaptive survival behavior, and they start producing these oils inside their cells in order to ward off the moment of their eventual demise. And from there, they go from roughly 250,000 liters to roughly 600,000 liters, most of which is the kind of oil that we need to put into soaps, detergents, foodstuffs, and everything else. Crush it, dry it, squeeze it out, and from two milliliters, you get 100 tons of oil. Exactly the same oil, molecule for molecule, as we currently get from palm kernel oil. Are we going to like that kind of stuff? <laughs> or are we going to say, oh, oh, I don't know about that? And it is going to be really difficult. We're going to get these dilemmas coming at us all the time, all the time, all the time. As industrial biotechnology kind of feeds into synthetic biology, we're going to get these dilemmas all the time. But some of them are going to be absolutely brilliant in terms of enabling us to use the land more intelligently, more compassionately than we're currently able to do. And God knows we might even find a way of restoring some of that land to purposes that don't necessarily feed us, i.e. some of the natural ecosystem services that we depend on, but we've currently spent so much time destroying. So in conclusion, it's an exciting, really, really exciting world. And for me, looking around the scene of creative chaos that is out there, this scene of excitement about new possibilities, the doability of what lies ahead, I think it is an extraordinary moment for us to recognize the role that we play in movements like this. One last thought. When I was doing my research for The World We Made and looking at many of these projects, on the ground projects, they split into two for me, and I call them Enclaves and outposts, and I think this is relevant to the world of permaculture. And enclaves were kind of refuges, a sense of people wanting to withdraw from the horror of our industrialized farming systems. Indicative that the start for our conference here was to pause a little and think about our sense of grief at the damage that we've done to the natural world. And an awful lot of people over the last four or five decades have 
withdrawn from that sense of horror about the damage we do to the earth and to ourselves into these refuges, into these enclaves, where we can indeed dream a different world. And we can think about the principles which would allow us to move forward in such a different way. Very important part of the permaculture world is developing that set of insights, that kind of perennial wisdom to shape our minds and our spirits. Very differently, closely connected, but very differently, one discovers all these outposts, people who want to put themselves on a front line somewhere, do not want to withdraw into a refuge, want to engage in a place of difficulty, sometimes even of danger, want to involve themselves in the lives of people very directly, who are not really worried about the niceties of theory about food security, but are grappling with the daily horror of food insecurity. This is something that I think we all need to pay more attention to. And these outposts are basically made of people who are out there joining their efforts, joining their passion to those of the communities in which they're working, to address social justice concerns as much as to address a different way of thinking about food production differently. And somewhere in that balancing act between refuges and outposts, between proper reflection and dreaming, and action-oriented social justice commitment to a better world for people right now, wrangling a better world, if you like, as well as dreaming it, somewhere that's the balancing act we now need to find. And I'm pretty sure the next couple of days will provide a huge amount of opportunity to think where we sit in that continuum and celebrate the incredible diversity that underpins it. So thank you for inviting me here today, and I hope you have a wonderful conference. Thank you. <laughs> Okay.